Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us at Bethel Church. Hello, I hear my mic now. Uh, whether you're online or in person, we're so happy to have you. Um, join us for the service this morning. It's going to be great. So why don't you guys stand and worship with us? I saw Satan fall like lightning. Darkness run for cover, but the miracle that I just can't get over my name is registered in heaven. I believe in signs and wonders, I have resurrection power. Still, the miracle that I just can't get over my name registered in heaven my praise belongs to you forever this is my testimony from death to life cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified this is my testimony this is my testimony Together, sons and daughters, bought with blood and washed in water, sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God will finish what He started. Our God will finish what He started. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify By Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified This is my testimony This is my testimony If I'm not dead If I'm not dead You're not done Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe this is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. From death to life, cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Oh, I think I unmuted it. Yes. Good morning. You may have a seat. It's so lovely to see you here. I see there are some visitors. Welcome. And for those of you online, welcome as well. I just want to let you know um, the ways that you can give this morning. We have the offering box at the back as well as at the Connect Desk. And there is also uh, a debit machine at the Connect Desk. And then you can give online as well through our website uh, using PayPal. 
So those are the ways you can give. Also, this is Launch Sunday, and we are so excited to have you here. Um, and we, Joe's kicking it off with a new sermon series, and we have our life group sign up at the back. There are uh, three life group options, really four, because one of them is split between guys and girls on alternating weeks. So please uh, feel free to take a look at those. Um, for those of you that d uh, are unfamiliar with a life group, a life group is uh, a smaller group of people that get together on, a m on the midweek. And so they get together to support each other through prayer, uh, studying the word, and, and just sharing and doing life together. So that's what a life group is. And if you're interested in that, um, obviously we're trying to do that with uh, COVID protocols in, in mind. So, um, and if, yeah, if also if you're interested in maybe hosting one, you can have a conversation with Joe. Um, as you could see this morning when you came in, we had coffee. I was excited about that. I don't know about you. So, woohoo. Um, so, yes, we're happy to have that, and we're, we're so excited for the people volunteering there. And, um, yes, please take some time to fellowship and enjoy one another's company uh, through a cup of coffee or tea. Um, we do have decaf tea for those that need it as well. And just remember to, to keep your distances, but to just really take some time together. And uh, this morning, I'd like to invite up Shirley. Thank you. I'm here this morning. I'm Shirley, and I'm on the mission team for Bethel. And Pastor Joe and Jan Wilson are also on our team. And we keep in touch with the missionaries we support. And, um, and we try and relay to you in sequence um, what's happening with them. I also want to thank all of you for your generous support of the missionaries by your uh, monthly envelope giving. Today, the bowlers, who are missionaries we support in Guinea, Africa, have sent us a five-minute video uh, by a young woman named Cassidy Paul. She lives in Florida. And she has a message, very heartfelt, very spirit-led message, especially for those of us over 50. But it's a good message for all of us. So enjoy the movie. This is, this is for my friends who are 50 years old and plus. Um, heck, if you're a little, a few years younger than that, take it with a grain of salt if you feel like this is for you too. Um, but I feel like this is specifically something on my heart right now for those who are 50 years old and up. Um, please hear me out. Please hear my heart in this. Please hear Jesus in this. Last night, my, my church opened up for the first time. Since, you know everything going on it was incredible, it was incredible. so beautiful I, I, was so I, I was so encouraged um but there was a specific, there was a specific moment, moment in worship two maybe times. two or three times where i looked off from where i was in one instance i saw an older gentleman um, way off ahead came by himself and he was just lost in the presence of god the entire time his arms out just focusing on jesus and it brought tears to my eyes and a little while later i looked over to my left and i saw an older couple um 60s 70s, 70s maybe lost in the lord as well and i began to cry again and i was like oh my gosh like i'm so moved by their worship and it's, not, and it's not to say, say, that, I'm to say that I'm not moved by other people's there's worship, but there's something precious, precious about, about when, 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 you're you're older, when you're older, when you're older, when you're wise, when you have experience with life, and you're able to just lose yourself like a child again. As if, like, your dignity and your reputation doesn't even matter because you're just there to lose yourself in the Lord. And it moves me. And all I can think of my spirit, I pull out my phone and my notes immediately and just started writing. And I was like, older generation, we need you. I need you. Wake up. Wake up, please. Yes, my generation, yes, my generation the, the millennials, Gen Z, millennials, whatever you want to call us, we're young and we're resilient, but we need 
guidance. We need direction and we need wisdom. And of course, first and foremost, we need to go to Jesus to get that. But we need fathers and mothers to guide us. We need you now, not later, not before. We need you now. And I, I, I'm saying this out of a, of, a, of a burning heart because I believe this with everything in me. We need your arms up in worship. We need your tears streaming, your hearts broken before the Lord. No pride, no, I told you so. Why didn't you listen to me earlier? We warned you, but we need you to rise up now. We need you. You aren't done yet. You haven't reached your point where the Lord is done with you. Start taking the authority for the things that the Lord has given you, for the things that he's told you to claim authority over, that he's given from the power in your mouth because of the Holy Spirit inside of you. Just because you've reached an age of retirement doesn't mean that everything in your life needs to retire. Yes, you might have reached a point where now you're not working and you're able to relax and praise God because that's something from the Lord when he brings rest. But that doesn't mean your fight is over. That doesn't mean your calling has ever left you. Till the day that you have your last breath, you have a mandate. You have a calling and a mandate from the Lord to father and mother the generations below you. And I'm telling you, with a broken heart, I need you. We need you. You're the ones who will hand off the keys to us one day. But we can't take those keys from you till the Lord says that you can release them and I don't believe that he's released them from you yet I think that the day that your generation has moved on to be with the Lord then he'll hand the keys he'll ask you to hand the keys to the generation below you but I'm speaking to you 57 year old 73 year old 96 year old 64 year old man and woman of God I need you you are not done. Please open your mouth out of wisdom and of course guidance of the Holy Spirit. But I need you to. You aren't finished yet. You are not done yet. And this is not to throw pressure on you and to say take all the responsibility. We don't want it. No, we have a responsibility. I have a responsibility to to guide and to, and to shepherd my own generation. But the one to come after me and I need your guidance on how that is done. I need your guidance on how to love Jesus deeper, on how to look him face to face and to sit at his feet and to pour out my perfume on him. I need your guidance and please hear me. Please hear me. I am praying for you and I repent and I apologize for my generation and for the other generations making you think that you're not worth it, making you think that you're done, that you don't have value that we don't need you anymore that you've reached a point where your voice doesn't matter or things were one way in your generation and now they're different which is true but that doesn't mean we don't need your voice so i repent for you feeling like that and being told that by us it's not true we need you and i love you from the pit of who i am but please do not stay silent Please guide us. Please father us. Please mother us. Please love us. We need to know the love of the Father through your life. And we need your guidance. Shepherd us and teach us with the Holy Spirit. Because you can't do it without him. And neither can we. But I believe he's bringing us together. He's tying our heartstrings together across generations. So that he may be glorified through our lives. And that the kingdom may be brought here. We need you, and I love you so, so much. District Superintendent Ken Russell, uh, he's kind of like my pastor. He always says, we're better together, and there's so much truth in that. You know, the church is a multi-generational church, and we need one another. And speaking as someone who's younger, we need you with gray hair uh, in, in, in the church here to, to really pass that, that torch and to, to guide us and to mentor us. And so uh, thank you for being here. You're noticed and you're appreciated. Um, we have a couple baptisms happening this Sunday, which is super exciting. Uh, and baptism is a public declaration of your faith in Jesus. And I just want to read a little bit. Um, 
out of Romans 6 that talks about baptism and the symbolism behind it, because there's very deep, rich symbolism behind baptism. And it says this, it says, Well then, should we keep sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we were joined uh, with him in his death? For he died, uh, for we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. And so baptism, what you're going to see in a couple moments is um, Brian's going to be baptized and he's going to go into the water and it's going to represent him dying to his old self, dying to sin. And then he's going to come out and it's going to be a symbolic of him rising with Christ and rising to a new life, new creation that, that God um, has ordained for him. So very exciting. Uh, we, now, there were some baptisms as well at the 9 a.m. service, and so we've pre-recorded their stories, their testimonies, and so we're going to show you the, the two stories first on, on video of the two girls who got baptized this morning, Savannah and Sierra, and then uh, we'll do Brian's story and his baptism, so enjoy. <laughs> Hi, I'm Savannah. I'm 12 years old, and this is my testimony. Um, so I attend an animal Christian school, which means that we have classes of Bible and devotions like every day. So my understanding of God and everything Bible related goes deeper five days a week, and then I have church on Sunday. So six days a week. Um, I grew up in a Christian family in a Christian home, so I was just, that's just what I was raised with. But as I get older, the more personal the relations, my relationship gets more personal. It's more my choice. I choose to want to give myself to Jesus and to get baptized and to just put my life in His hands. Um, I accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior a couple years ago. And so now I just think that I should get baptized as the next step in my journey with Jesus. So I'm ready to get baptized. Okay. <laughs> my testimony. Hi, I am Sierra Gain. I am eight years old, almost nine. I'm in grade four, and I go to Nanaimo Christian School. Okay, I am getting baptized today because when I was little, I put my life into Jesus' hands. I prayed to the Lord four times a day, sometimes even five, to put some time aside to talk to the Lord. Melanie has taught me wonderful things about the Lord, and Joe has shown me that He's the one and only Savior. I grew up knowing Him, but now our relationship is way more stronger, and He will always keep us safe. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Brian Grzecki and I uh, grew up here in Ladysmith and I'm at Bethel Church today and I'm going to get baptized. Um, yeah, it's been uh, a long road for me um, coming to this point in my life um, and I've uh, had a tough childhood growing up. Uh, I mean, I had, a, I had it good, you know, I got to go to school, um, had good friends, um, but I didn't really have beliefs to lead me in any direction um, and so because of that uh, I guess I felt uh, bullied by the world and, um, and that caused me you know a lot of discomfort and gave me the feeling that I needed to hide my true self um, so without the belief uh, I made myself feel more comfortable by just blending in the best I could just to be unnoticed um, I lived this way for a long time and after the pressures of life came down on me, I, uh, you know, I found myself lost. Um, it was then that I had a, a spiritual awakening. And during that process of healing, I felt uh, a welcoming presence. Um, it was uh, the unconditional love of God. And uh, when I felt that for the first time, it felt like a miracle had happened. 
And uh, shortly after that experience, I met my wife Kimberly, uh, and she uh, she helped me. She basically uh, led me towards Jesus, um, and we started going to church together. Uh, and, um, yeah, she just uh, helped me on that journey, and we traveled to Vietnam together, uh, which really opened my eyes um, to a lot of things. Uh, experiencing new culture was uh, one of them. And uh, yeah, just my love and trust for Jesus grew a lot stronger um, with that experience. And I felt safer knowing he was there guiding me. Um, uh, yeah, since following Christ, uh, I'm a whole new person. And I'm ready to become a born-again Christian and uh, dedicate my life to Jesus. <laughs> Amen. Right on. Well, I'm here with, with Brian for uh, what is now my third COVID baptism, and I hope you can hear me through the, through the mask. Uh, but Brian, before you, you get in the water and we, and we do this thing, uh, I just have a question for you, and that's, uh, do you believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and God raised him from the dead? I certainly do, yes. Right on. All right, you can take off your, your mask and, and get in the, in the tub. It's so warm, you have no idea. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 it's just that temperature so you remember this day forever. <laughs> yeah. Right on. Right on. <laughs> you said it's pleasant, it's nice. Uh, <laughs> oh my goodness. All right. Well, Brian, uh, based on your confession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> right on. So, so one thing uh, that we did a little bit later in the first service, but we'll actually do right now. If you want to just stretch out your hands towards Brian, we're just going to pray for him. Father, I thank you so much for Brian. I thank you for the commitment that he has made to follow you. I thank you for the new life uh, that you have brought him to, God, from death to life. And I just pray an incredible blessing over, over him. May he uh, just live his life to the fullest with newfound identity and purpose and just be so full and empowered by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. And stand and continue to worship with us. Oh 
this morning. Heavenly Father, let that that be the cry of our hearts, not just the words that we sing. God, that we would become more and more like you and less and less like us. Jesus, that your your Holy Spirit would just, just fill us and empower us. Even right now in this moment, we pray, come Holy Spirit. And Father God, we just pray for the, the world right now as it's, it's faced with the coronavirus and, and just the, the loss and the grief, and the, whether it's the loss of, of loved ones and the, and the many, many deaths around the world, or, or maybe it's just the loss of routine and loss of freedom, uh, the loss of, of, of control. Father, as, as we're grieving that, God, we want to come alongside as a church and grieve with others. And so I pray that we would be like Jesus weeping at the tomb of Lazarus, God, that we, w- we would come alongside others and bring encouragement and hope and peace where there's despair and hopelessness. Father, I just pray for people in the church who are sick and, and feeling unwell. God, I pray just a, a healing touch on their lives. For those who, who are lonely and, and maybe you're watching at home and you're isolated and, 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 and you just don't feel a part of it, that, that this service you're kind of watching from a distance. God, I just pray that right now, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that they would feel so included. They would feel so welcome. They would, they would feel a, a, just a complete touch of your presence in a powerful way. And I pray for the, the, the sermon, God, as we open your word, as we hear what you have to say, that my voice would become very, very quiet and yours would become very loud. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. And thanks, everyone. You can grab a seat. Thanks, Pastor Alexis and team. <clears throat> right on. Well, um, yeah, here we go. I don't think I've ever started a sermon that way before. I was going to say something, and anyways. Have you ever noticed uh, that when a story starts with this one time, 
It's going to be a little bit of a wild ride. Have you noticed that? Well, this one time, uh, I led. I was leading a young adults group, and it was it was quite casual. We would they would Mel and I would have them over at our house, and uh, we would we do a Bible study together and just kind of hang out and, and talk out. And it would quite often go very late. And if you know anything about me, you know that I don't do late nights super well. I'm a, hey, you know it's 9.30, it's time to go to bed kind of guy for the most part. And even in my young adult years, I went to bed pretty, pretty early. And, uh, <laughs> and so basically at the end of the night, you'd have to forcibly remove the young adults from, from our house. Uh, you know, you start out... E- easily with, with, you know, those subtle host hints. You, you clean off the coffee table. Uh, you, you know, you start looking at your, your watch. Uh, you, do, you do the stretch, you know, and, uh, and then slowly you move to things that are a little bit more obvious, right? You're like, oh, wow, look at the time. It's getting late, guys. Uh, and, and that doesn't work. You begin doing the dishes. And then finally, it's like, hey, go home. Like, it's midnight. What are you still doing here? I want to go to bed. And on one such night, um, it, was, it was after midnight, and I was sitting on the couch, just kind of decompressing. Everyone had just, just left, and I, my phone rings. And so I pick up my phone, and I answer it, and it was one of our, our young adult friends. And he said, hey, Joe, my, my car died. Can you, can you give me a, a boost? And I'm like, sure, are you just outside my house? He's like, no, no, I'm actually uh, at this abandoned parking lot across town. I was like, all right. Whatever, man. Uh, sure, I'll be there. So I, I put on my rain jacket. It's, it's pouring rain outside, and it, it's pitch black. And I drive across town to this abandoned uh, parking lot, and, and, and my friend is there. And he's there with another friend of his that I don't know at all. And it looks a little bit sketchy, you know, just kind of that, that look. And I didn't really clue in at the time, but hindsight being 2020, he was probably a drug dealer, okay? Let's just call it what it was. And, um, and so I pull up uh, next to, next to my, my friend and I, to give him a boost pouring rain, I, I, I start to pop open the trunk, and I jump back right away. There was something alive inside the hood of my, my car. It was something that had darted from one side of my engine to the other. And so I, I got back, and I slowly lifted the hood, and right on top of the engine was a rat's nest. Now, I don't know if you know, know this or not, but um, rats... They, they just wreak absolute havoc on the engine of your vehicle if they get stuck in there. They eat wires. They, they eat little, you know, non-consequential stuff like uh, oil lines and, uh, you know, engine fluid lines and brake fluid lines. You know, just, just small stuff, right? And so we're thinking to ourselves, like, okay, we've got we to gotta figure out a way to get rid of this thing. We've got to figure out a way to kill it. And as we're kind of debating how to do this, my friend has this great idea. He's like, hey... I think I've got a crossbow at the back of my car. <laughs> and he, he excitedly ran to his car for a crossbow. And I'm like running all these scenarios through my head. And I'm thinking to myself, there is no scenario that I can picture where the rat actually dies and that my engine is not destroyed and blown up or like one of us is stabbed in the eye and we're going to the emergency. Like there's just no good way that this was going to turn out. And thankfully, his crossbow was not there. Uh, so we dodged a bullet on that one or maybe an arrow. Um, but after some more discussion, we decided the best way to kill this rat was with a tire iron. Um, and, and so we were looking with our flashlights uh, in our, you know, from our cell phones in the engine. We finally found it. It was kind of down there a little ways. And we figured we could take it a tire iron and, and stab it and, and kill it. Now, I'm a fisherman. I've killed my fair share of animals. But something about killing a rat with a tire iron just seemed a little bit barbaric to me, you know? Um, and so I'm here with this tire iron, and I didn't really stab it very hard. In fact, to be completely honest with you, it was, it was more of a gentle prod. You know, it was a little poke. It was kind of like, boop, you know? And so the rat ran, <laughs> ran away underneath the engine. And we're like, man, how are we going to get this thing out of here? And finally, I had a great idea. So I, I put down the hood of my car, and I drove around the par- empty parking lot just slamming the gas down, hitting the brake, and just swerving back and forth like a madman. Anything that I could do just to knock this rat loose. And uh, finally, it, it worked. Like, I don't know how it worked, but the rat was gone. I guess he just couldn't hold on, and he, he got knocked loose. All right? It, sometimes tr- truth is really stranger than fiction. Now, I know you all want to know what the moral of the story is, so here it is. There is none. It's just a good story. 
And see, there's, there's something about stories, right? Stories pull us in. They, they, they draw us in. They engage us. We can relate to stories. You know, you probably don't have your own story of being in the pouring rain with a rat and a drug dealer. Um, but you probably have your own, you know, you can't make this stuff up kind of story. And, I mean, look at us. This is 2020. I think we all have one of those stories by now, if not several dozen. Um, but the best stories teach us something. The best stories have morals. They influence us. They shape us. Stories are powerful. The best lessons in life rarely have three bullet points, right? The best stories, uh, the best lessons are stories. They're lived out, right? And and people, think about, we don't live our lives in point form. We don't live our lives in a textbook. We live our lives in story. And the lessons aren't always sequential or obvious, And often it isn't until we sit back with some introspection that we really begin to discern the meanings in our story. This morning, we heard very powerful stories of lives changed by the gospel, by the good news of Jesus. We were part of their story as we we clapped and we cheered as they were baptized. And so the question that I have for all of us this morning is, whose story are you living? Whose story are you living? See, it, our culture gives us scripts. They give us storylines to live. Um, stories of what life is supposed to look like in the Western world. The script in the, in the Western world is that meaning is really created. You, you create your own meaning. Life is really meaningless, and so whatever uh, you can find to create meaning, uh, good for you. Right? Uh, we live our lives in the pursuit of happiness. And, and the definition of happiness has really moved away from, from satisfaction and contentment to really being all about pleasure and what makes you feel good at any given moment. And I want to give you just a, a classic story, a, a classic Western life script, and, and maybe you'll see some familiarities with your story, and, and not everything in the story is, is a negative thing, so I'm not trying to offend anyone or anything. I'm just saying that there is a, a constant pattern uh, we all are thinking, you know, we're living these really big individualistic lives and, and, and we're, we're so different, but so many of our stories look like this or have parts that look a lot like it. So here's the classic Western life script. You grow up in a traditional, often religious home that oppresses the real you. You go off to university or, or to the big city and you discover your true self. You, you kind of shake off all of those traditional barriers. You enter the workforce, you you fall in love, you get married, you have kids, you buy your first home, you buy a boat, Um, your marriage gets a little bit rocky and, and, and you end up getting a divorce. You buy a sports car, you get a new husband or a new wife, you retire with a white picket fence and you live out the best years of your life until you die. Does that sound familiar? See, the problem with this story is that it lacks any kind of meaning or hope. See, uh, there's a leadership podcaster and author, Kerry Newoff, and he writes this, there is no end to the sad discontent of making you the mission of your life. Friends, I'm here this morning to tell you, you need a better story. You were created to thrive and not just survive. You were created to stand out and not just fit in. And Scripture has a better story for your life. There's a better story for your life, and it's found in here in the Bible. And the Bible tells the story of God, and it tells the story of us. And this story is called the Gospel or the Good News. And it all starts on the first page in the book of Genesis. If you've got a Bible, you can turn there. If not, it's okay. You can follow along on the screen. But I just want to tell you a little bit about Genesis. Genesis is the first book of the Bible, but it's actually a part one in a five-part series called the Pentateuch. And so when we, we read Genesis, we have to read it in light of not just the whole Bible, but we also have to read it in light of the Pentateuch. It's, it's kind of like, you know, picking up a Lord of the Rings and reading the two towers and saying, okay, that's good enough, and, and kind of thinking you're going to know what's going on. It's part of a larger story. And so all we're going to read today is the first verse. It says this, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. See, today we're, we're starting this, this new series called The Gospel According to Genesis. And over the next couple of years, we're going to take 
sizable portions of, of Genesis, and we're going to go through it a little bit at a time. And the reason that we're doing this is, is the book of Genesis really lays down a foundation of flourishing, a foundation for your life, and it starts from the beginning. And if you're a follower of Jesus, this is our story. This is our life script, and it's good. And it can be healthy for us to be reminded of it because sometimes we forget. Sometimes we, we know it up here, but we don't actually live out the story that we're called to. Now, before we unpack the significance of, of that verse that I read, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, I want to let you know what this sermon is not, okay? Uh, if you're looking for, for me to comment on the interplay of science and the Bible, this is not that sermon. I'm just going to be really honest. I'm a pastor, not a scientist. Um, and Genesis, so often we, we get distracted on, on the how, right? We really want to know how God created the world and how that relates to science. And there's so much, uh, there's such a wealth of information about that, so, so many resources, good, bad, and everywhere in between on that topic. What I want to focus on during the series is the what. And when we, instead of getting distracted by the how, we want to take a look at the what. And I'm going to explain that uh, for you right away here. Our way of thinking here in the West is heavily influenced by Greek ways of thought. Right? We want empirical data. When we read the book of Genesis, we want to know how God created the world. But that's the wrong question to be asking. See, we need to remember that Genesis was not written for or by a Greek audience. It was written for a Jewish audience. And in ancient Judaism, uh, they would have very little, if any at all, concern for how God created the world. The question that we should be asking, the more Jewish question, the, the question that reflects the text the best, is what? What does creation teach me about God's relationship with the world and my place in it? What does this have to tell me about who I am? What am I to do in light of this revelation? And perhaps most importantly of all, science can never answer the who question what the Bible does. Who created the world? God. And there's some incredibly insights to be gained from this thoughtful and faithful reading of Genesis. And so if you want to know what the Bible has to say about who you are and what your place is in this world, if you're looking for a sense of identity and purpose and meaning, if you need a better story, then this sermon is for you. And the first thing that we see when we read Genesis 1-1 is that this is his story. In case you forgot our text this morning, it's in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. See, right away we're confronted with a very uncomfortable truth. This is his story and not ours. Just like that, four words into the Bible, into the biblical narrative, we are removed from, from the lead character to supporting actor. Just like that. The second thing that we see is that God created and this conflicts with our, our society's naturalistic worldview, doesn't it? It, it conflicts with the, the idea that, that the world was just an accident and, and there really is no meaning to life and you just live and you die and, and that's kind of it. Instead, we're, we're given a different story. We're told that the world didn't come to being by accident but that there was actually an artist who created the world and that history actually has an author. And thirdly, we see that the story is going somewhere. Ten years ago, uh, the hit series Lost uh, finished up on, on, uh, on the TV. Who here remembers Lost? Anyone? Yeah, a couple of people. Lost was, was kind of epitomized like the binge-worthy TV show of our, our, our time. It just like every, every series, uh, season, sorry, ended with like a huge cliffhanger. All of the episodes in between ended with a cliffhanger and the story just grew more and more and more and more elaborate as you went on. And so when the six seasons were coming to a close and they announced that the finale was coming, uh, fans just, just were enthralled. Like, how are they going to pull this intricate story together? How are they going to bring in all of the different pieces? What is the resolution of this story that I've invested the last six years of my life into? Well, 
If you watched Lost, you know that what followed was probably the most disappointing TV finale in the history of TV shows. It was kind of like they had just sort of threw stuff in there without the ending in mind, and then they're like, ah, let's just end it like this and call it a day. Is, is sort of how it ended. And so when we look at the biblical story, we realize that a proper story, a good story, has a good beginning and a good ending. There is a resolution at the end. And so when the biblical story is, opens with, in the beginning, you know that there's going to be an end. And I'm here to tell you that it is, not, uh, it is not just loose and not thought out like the lost season finale. Theologian Derek Kidner puts it very eloquently. He says, the opening expression in the beginning is more than a bare note of time. The beginning is pregnant with the end. And the whole process present, present to God who is first and last. What a, what a powerful image. Right? It's fitting that the biblical story not only begins with creation, but also ends with new creation. From creation to new creation, this is his story. All of the biblical story, all of history, our, our present, our future, is all part of God's redemptive story. The story of how he is making all things new. And there's so much to be revealed about God in, in just these opening lines. We see, see that God is an eternal being outside of time. That he's a creative God. That there, there's this, just this overwhelming feeling of his totality, his sovereignty, the first, the last, over everything, creating everything, his majesty, his creativity. And it's all in just this first sentence. We really begin to see a picture of who God is. And more than that, we can also see Jesus. We can see Jesus. You see, one thing that's going to become immediately apparent to you as we go throughout this series is that everything turns to Jesus. Absolutely everything. Everything that we read points to Jesus. When you read the Bible, if you can't figure out a way to make it point to Jesus, you are reading it wrong. Every passage in Scripture points to our Savior. And so what we find is, is hundreds of years later, the, uh, the Apostle John wrote his story about Jesus. He wrote about Jesus' life, and he pays a tribute to Genesis with his own Genesis-type introduction. And he writes this, In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. See, this is incredibly important because often we pit Jesus against the God of the Old Testament. When we don't realize that they're one and the same. We, we look at the Old Testament and we, and we struggle with, 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 with what we see there. Sometimes we, we think that God is vindictive or, or cruel. Uh, and then we, we think that he just changed his personality overnight when Jesus came to earth in the flesh. But that's not a faithful reading of scripture. What we see is that Jesus didn't just show up halfway through history. Jesus was there at the beginning. That the God that we know, the God that we love, the God that we have a relationship with, the God that has a purpose for your life, was there at the beginning. And so in one sentence, the biblical narrative dismantles hopelessness. Right? In, in, uh, if the world is designed and not an accident, then it opens us up to a whole new realm of possibilities. Right? Maybe we're, we're put on this earth for a purpose after all. Maybe there's meaning outside of our fleeting happiness. Maybe there's more to life than the script, the story that you have been told. And friends, this leads us to our next point. Our story begins with his story. Our story begins with his story. Right? While this is his story, that doesn't mean that we don't have our own lives. It doesn't mean that, that we don't have our own lives, make our own choices every day about the type of person that we want to be and, and, and who we want to become, right? The problem comes when we try to be the center of our own lives, when we try to create ourselves in allowing, instead of allowing God to create us. When we flip the script and we put ourselves in the beginning instead of God, it ends in disaster, Right? We've all seen the effects of selfishness and greed and anger and envy and hatred and, and, and the like that have had on the world. This sinful side of humanity leads to destruction and death. And so when we try to create our story, even with the best of intentions, we end up messing everything up. 
But if we make him the center of our lives, that changes everything. Right? You heard the stories this, this morning of Brian and, and, and Sierra and Savannah as they, they, they were reborn, as they were recreated, as, as, as they, they gave up their, their purpose uh, in, in, in life for Jesus' purpose in life. See, it's, it's when we surrender our lives to his purpose, when we adopt his identity and calling for our lives, that is when we truly begin to live. Jesus himself said the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is that we, uh, sorry, my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. See, the paradox is that only to experience life, it is only when we actually give up our lives that we truly begin to live. When we recognize whose story we're actually in, that we actually have the freedom that we've always craved. See, so often we try to improve ourselves, to recreate ourselves, but it just ends up being the same old story on repeat. And the only way to break the cycle is actually to be recreated. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. It is never too late to become a new creation. The first step, recognize that you need a better story. And ask the band to come on up. So I just want to conclude our time this morning by asking you a very simple question. Do you need a better story? Is your life defined by Jesus? Have you allowed him to create you? Or are you still trying to recreate yourself? Are you still trying to write your own story instead of allowing God to write for you? To submit to to his rule and reign, to his goodness, to his grace, to experience the life that is truly life. Would you pray with me? You know, no one's looking around. And if you're here this morning and you've heard what I said and you're like, you know what, Joe, I, I want to live life for Jesus. I want to experience this life that you're talking about. I want to be recreated. If that's you, could you just raise your hand? No one's looking around. Right on, thank you. Anyone else? If you raise your hand, just say this prayer with me. Jesus, I've tried living my own life. I've tried to create myself, and it's ended in failure. Jesus, would you recreate me? I want to follow you and serve you. I want to be your apprentice. Lead me into the life that is truly life. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. If you prayed that prayer for the very first time, you are a new creation. And maybe you're here and you follow Jesus and you just realize, you know, I've come a little bit off track. You know, I'm trying to do things on my own instead of turning to God and allowing him to steer my story. If that's you, I want you to know that it's not too late to bring it back to God. And so we're going to close with this, this declaration. This is my testimony. This is my story. There's a, there's a great old hymn, This is my story, this is my song, Serving my Savior all the day long. And so let's sing that together. Let's declare that we follow Jesus. This is my testimony from death to life Cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify By Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified This is my testimony testimony If I'm not dead, you're not done Greater things are still to come Oh, I believe If I'm not dead, you're not done Greater things are still I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm 
not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe this is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story, I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Right on. Well, friends, thank you so much for worshiping with us. And when you go from here, live out your testimony. Live out your story. God bless you. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. We're so happy you decided to spend a little piece of your morning with us from wherever you are. Um, take a minute right now, subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss out on any of the updates and services we have on Sunday mornings here at Bethel. And we hope that you have a great rest of your week and we'll see you next Sunday.